Welcome back to the Racial Draft Podcast. I am your host, Michael Terrell Ford III, not joined by our regular, irregular, um, sometimes co-host, Marquis Keaton. Uh, we have a special guest co-host. Uh, let's have that special guest co-host uh, an- announce herself. What's up? It is your girl, captain of the multiracial team and front runner of the whole racial podcast. Um, I mean, not podcast, but, you know, the whole racial draft. Yeah. From Kia Bernstein, a.k.a. Kia, a.k.a. Awesome, a.k.a. Me. Now, that was a lot of energy. Um, I, I feel like I need to step my energy levels up to meet you. You do. You do. All right. So, uh, if you're new to the Racial Draft Podcast, you're in for a wild ride. Hopefully, you're a regular listener and you're ready for a change of pace. Hold the reins. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, this is what we, what we do here is we go through the various comic book universes and our team, our panel of team captains, uh, picks players to flip their racial uh, makeup, racial ethnic makeup, or to keep them as they were. So uh, this week is the ninth round, so we're going to be recapping the round that was and maybe look ahead to the round that will be. Um, As always, you can support the Racial Draft um, on our various, uh, by subscribing on our various platforms, uh, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, uh, Anchor is our hub. Um, You can can basically subscribe at any of your, wherever you get your podcasts. Um, Also, uh, we, we accept money. Uh, send us send us money. That'll help the podcast grow as well. Show me the money. <laughs> exactly. And of course, you know, comment on our on our various social media, and we'll shout you out. We love shout outs, and you know, all the other five star rating, uh, Apple, uh, Google. Like I said before, give us ratings. Ratings lift us up, get us more seen, get our listenership up, and blow up this racial draft podcast to the pop culture phenomenon that it deserves to be. But on that note, uh, Kia, do you want to just talk about the week that was and as far as the draft is concerned? You know, I mean, I know you got to go first, so you got to to kick everything off. But, you know, putting aside your pick specifically, um, how did you feel about this this most recent round? Boring. Boring. That's what I felt. Bored. I was like, oh, my gosh. So bored. Wow, you see? Like, I actually wanted Joaquin to go harder on his, like, story. That's how bored I was. Wow, and you never like Joaquin's stories. I know. It's so... Yeah, let's just not go there. But you know what they are? Well, we're about to go there because we need... I, I need to figure out how to reconcile the energy you're bringing to the podcast with the boredom. And let's start with your pick, uh, the leadoff uh, Cyclops, a.k.a. Scott Summers, who you drafted right. to the multiracial team. Who's um, your daddy? Exactly. Um, the, you know, as you remember, the previous pick was uh, Cable. So you went ahead and drafted Cable's father. Mm-hmm. Um, would you like to say a little bit more about your pick, your thought process, what you were thinking, um, you know, about the character and why he, he would be a good fit for your team? Um, just like Megan the Stallion said, I don't want your in, I want his daddy. Ow. Um, so I just thought that overall, like, you know, I like his demeanor and the way he looks at the world and he kinda I feel like him and like Captain America, like technically. Like, you know, are kinda similar. Therefore probably sometimes probably clash. I think as in comic book lore there's it said, or maybe in an actual comic book. I'm not sure because I haven't read that one. But um, yeah, you have. Uh, I wrote a whole thing, which I figured you're going to read. Um, well, I mean, you're here. You're here. Oh, right? well, well, go ahead because I, I can't see it. So I was going to yeah. let you say it in your own words. No, 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 no. No, what I what I wrote then that was you know that was, that was priceless and just genius. Just, yeah, you have to share it. Go ahead. Wow, all right. Well, you got me on the spot because I assume that you were gonna I assume you were gonna say your own thing, but give me a second, people. Listeners, we are all about shenanigans and t- technical difficulties here at the Racial Draft Podcast, and this week is no exception. So let me dive on I can, in. I can sing the Hanson brothers while you try to find it. 
All right, well, thank you, and also, I'm sorry, people. So, so this was uh, this is what Kia said. Kia didn't want to uh, put her voice on the podcast that she co-hosts. Um, well, it just sounds better when you say it, but I mean, the fact that I worked really hard to write that out, I mean, it took a lot of energy out of me. You know, my you know how much energy it took out of me. Yes, this is a... Uh, this is something like your first backstory. Um, I mean, it's not really a backstory, as much as an explanation of the pick, which you know to me holds equal weight. But um, yeah, it was, it was it was, it was helpful, and uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to do justice to your thought process. Uh, Scott Summers is the perfect addition to the multiracial team. He has led the X Men through many challenges, but people focus on his failures more than his successes. He has spent his life believing that he has to be twice as good, if not perfect. Even opening his eyes is dangerous, so he has to be the model of restraint and control at all times. Black men know what it's like to be seen as the danger and to feel pressure to be perfect and composed in order to survive. Light-skinned biracial black men are often mocked for the sensitivity, despite the adversities they've experienced in trying to bridge two cultures, not necessarily feeling home either. Scott, who has had to deal with an absentee father, has had to grow up fast, and over the years, became a surrogate father to many mutant children. The superheroes are like athletes. Scott is a little bit Russell Wilson, a little bit Colin Kaepernick, trying to preserve the kids of the future, but trying but willing to be militant and a martyr for his people. Movies and cartoons have made you hate this man, but he clearly has swag, pulling not one but two hot telepaths. And even creepy Logan respects his gangster. Plus, he's got his kids back. With cable already in the most racial fold, Scott gets to build a relationship with his Omega mutant son while breaking the cycle of absentee fatherhood. There's a cookout at the Summer's house, and it just got a little blacker, y'all. God, so, this just brought a tear to my eye. It's so beautiful. You know, uh, sure. So we want to welcome a special, uh, a special guest uh, who's currently connecting. That's Martin Sanchez of the Latinx team. Uh, Martin, say what's up. We just uh, got, a, got a little draft talk. Um, just tell the people, you know, a little bit, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, so I'm a 25-year-old guy. Uh, oh, he's so cute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what? Oh, sorry. Uh, okay. Um, I'm very clearly, you know, I'm on brand as we discussed earlier, like on the Discord. I'm currently wearing a little Green Lantern. I see your Green Lantern logo. Yeah, my specifically my Kyle Rayner logo. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's so. Uh, I just thought, you know, I might, I might as well be on brand for the first time. I actually end up calling for this. All right, this is your first, first your first time on the pod. Welcome. Welcome. You know, uh, Martin has graduated from a listener to a uh, contributor to now a podcast guest. You see, people, there is a path. There's a pathway to, to success. He's so cute. <laughs> <laughs> Look at him smiling. Oh. The Patreon subscribers will yeah. get the video, but he had just he is just will uh, make fun of make fun of Martin as the show progresses, try to get him to blush. And uh, it's fairly successful. I honestly don't know if I can. I'm too brown for that. <laughs> but he's so cute. Oh, my God. Oh, you're so smiling. Oh, my God. I can't. I, I'm not going to be able to get over this. Right. The whole podcast. Thank you, you for showing your face. You're going to need to comport yourself. I do not want an HR request. Okay. <laughs> well, don't worry. As the self-appointed commissioner of the racial draft, our co-commissioner of the racial draft, don't worry. <laughs> but Martin, just throw those away. We were just talking about Kia's pick, the, uh, the first pick in the draft in the multiracial team. Did you have any thoughts about this pick? Uh, it's a really good pick. Uh, like Cyclops definitely was someone we were discussing, and especially it would have It was very vague with Cable last week, so it was like, oh yeah, we could have easily maybe if we could sneak in Latinx Cyclops. But yeah, it's a really good pick. I feel like points wise, he's definitely going to be good. He's you know, uh, like um, I'm not super familiar 
with a lot of X-Men stuff. I mean, I grew up with like the 90s animated show, mm -hmm. but that was years ago. Right. And, <laughs> and you know, the, well, show, the show is all about slandering Cyclops to make Wolverine look good. So, you know, yeah. Like, and the movie too. Interesting character in the books as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. The movies did that too, I think, to an extent. Oh, don't get me started. Oh, yeah. <laughs> don't get me started. Definitely. Marsden. Um, but... But yeah, I mean, I think that they've done a lot of good with him over the years. I mean, you know, he's, he's, had, his, he's had his ups and downs as far as doing some morally questionable things. But mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, in a lot of ways, his experience as the, what used to be a teacher's pet of Professor X, the prize student, and, you know, seeing how over time he became more and more militant and more and more, um, uh, what's his name, you know, radicalized as the plight of mutants became harder and tougher, you know, only to have him now, you know, now that they've achieved, you know, their little slice of the world in Krakoa, he seems very content. He seems like he finally got his happy ending. He's got his family. He's got his uh, a, a, a duty, a, a place to protect, uh, people to look out for. And, you know, and, and he, it seems like he's, he's actualized. And in a lot of ways, the X-Men book is, he's the lead of the book. Um, they're they're seeing you know every week is a is a different adventure where Cyclops puts together a team and and, and solve a problem. So you know as far like you said as far as points go, you know Cyclops is is a is a big player and this is the ninth round to have you know this this kind of talent on the board is, is a is, is really good. <clears throat> Yet again, key is relentless chasing of points, uh, points over plot wins out. Yet again. I mean, I get it. I get it. I like a nice balance to it. Points and plot. But, you know. Yeah, everyone... winning's winning, you know. There, there's no balance in winning other than you won. Yeah. <laughs> it's good. It's good to have, it's good to have uh, two of the two of the front running teams as I as I Whoa, said. whoa, whoa. Don't throw that front runner name out there just like that. Like, I mean, come on. People have to earn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yes, that is it's front runner TM, uh, and we'll call you the lead. <laughs> the lead runner and the front runner. Yeah, sure, we'll do that. Whatever you call us, we use world number one anyway. So whatever. Exactly. But uh, let's what? Play. <laughs> I feel like in the words of Marquis, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> but um but yeah that's the cyclops pick i mean it's a i'm sure we'll revisit it as things progress because cyclops has a lot of interactions with the other characters um how about the second pick which was the native american delegation and they came they came pretty strong with cletus cassidy uh carnage now are you very aware of carnage martin Kind of. I'm definitely more of a DC person than a Marvel person. I'm gonna admit that. So, but I'm I'm aware of Carnage. And, okay. You know, yeah. And what about you, Kia? You're a big Carnage fan. Um, I used to be until the Native Americans took him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I he's all right. I'm not not too familiar with him, but I mean, from what I've gathered and what I looked at. He seems pretty cool. It's an eye pick. Bye. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, he's in a lot of ways he's Spider-Man's Joker. Um, in, in in the sense of not in the sense of making jokes, but in the sense of being uh, sadistic and murderous. Um, it he is what would happen if a symbiote. If you gave a serial killer the powers of a symbiote, um, he. He's all about that carnage, so to speak. You know, he, he's murder, death, kill, chaos, and uh, and and he really tests Peter Parker's role because this is not a character that typically wants to kill people, and here's someone who's all about wanting to kill people, and he has to figure out a way to uh, bring, continuously bring this character to justice, even knowing that doing so. You know, Carnage will probably escape, and you know, and then in a lot of ways, um, you know, Venom, 
Venom sits in the mid midpoint between the two characters because Venom is about trying to do good while being willing to kill. Um, whereas, you know, Peter Parker is in that way extreme of wanting to do good without killing. So he's a good, you know, he's a good character. He's all, what tends to happen with Carnage is that he's so overpowered that he doesn't appear a lot. But when he does appear, he does a lot of damage. And then he kind of has to go away for a while so that everything can kind of be reset. Like he had his own event uh, a few months back. So I'm not sure if we're going to get Carnage. Um, you know, we're going to get Carnage soon. But Is that close to like no points or what? Um, it's hard to say. It's hard to say. Like, like I said, he's, he, uh, he's a character that benefits from a little bit less exposure. So it's possible that, that we'll get a, a taste of Carnage in the coming months, but, you know, we won't choke him, so to speak. <laughs> let's, jump into, let's jump into the backstory. Joaquin always comes with a, a developed cinematic backstory. Are we going to cut it in half or reading the whole thing? I mean, we, we, we're, we're allowed. I mean, if you want, we can do it like campfire style where uh, we each take a little part and we can jump in, or you can just stick me with a job, which. Oh, yeah, I'm going to stick you with a job. Yeah, I think I wouldn't do his story justice. I'd be like, oh, I'm so bored. I keep talking, I hear my voice, blah, blah, blah. Got you, got you. Just real quick, uh, you got a little, little slight background noise. Um, if you could. You know, and not overshadow me as I talk. That would be great. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I'll jump in on back, Joaquin's backstory. Black, uh, his name is Carl Ashuk. So sorry, Carl Askuk, a man with a troubled past, committing his first crime at age nine. Now on the run from the FBI and tribal police for a triple homicide. On one occasion, he's running and hiding in the mountains of Montana. He's surviving out here on his own. One night, a meteor shower occurs. One lands a few hundred yards from his location. Brandishing his knife, he goes to investigate. As he looks at the crash site, he realizes something in the dark is stalking him. As he turns, a red creature latches onto him tightly. Through great pain, this creature is absorbing his body. A few nights go by and local townspeople find out an entire family went missing on a camping trip. A search party is sent, only to be systematically hunted one by one. The authorities and members of the search party spot the creature and begin opening fire as it moves unnaturally through the tops of trees and terrain. The creature goes in for another attack, head on. Suddenly, it stops dead in its tracks and runs off. The group is dumbfounded as they turn the line only to find they inadvertently started a forest fire due to the hot brass of their weapons. Carl awakens at dawn, having no recollection of the night before. He wakes up outside of a town and tries to hide his face as he entered. He's captured and thrown into a mental ward. The creature lies within him, dormant, yet learning, watching, and waiting. After months inside, the voice returns, this time speaking to him in his Blackfoot language, planning their escape. When the orderlies come into his cell, he kills them both and begins their escape. Carl asks the creature its name. He hasn't one. They escape and lie low. Watching the news, Carl hears the reporter describe the scene of the ward as total carnage. Carl speaks to the creature. Carnage it is. So, I mean, yet again, uh, Joaquin made a mini movie for us. And um, you know, this was interesting because I think we don't get a lot of um, Carl Ashuk's uh, backstory, um, you know, because in, in the mainstream Marvel world, uh, Cletus Cassidy, while, while he was a fairly new character when he was introduced, they really laid out, you know, how bad of a dude he was. You know, they really kind of talked him up. He was a he was um, Eddie Brock's cellmate, and he was just a loathsome guy, like a really really slimy dude. You know, who who enjoyed who enjoyed uh, hurting people. So he was exactly the kind of guy that the minute that you saw that he was exposed to a symbiote, you knew that he was bad news. Um, I think this is more of a slow burn to that, um, but I'm you know I'd be very curious as to sort of how how this carnage would interact with the other characters, particularly when this origin doesn't really connect him to Venom any. Um, I know at one point um, Joaquin had thought about uh, drafting Venom, so it's going to be interesting to see whether um, he comes back around and gets both Carnage and Venom 
uh, figures out maybe sort of retcons, uh, retcon some kind of connection between the two. That remains to be seen. That's just speculation on my part. Um, Kia, you uh, mentioned that you were a little overwhelmed by this by this uh, uh, pick. Would you uh, elaborate a little bit? Well, I I mean I understand like obviously like the character itself, Carnage, <laughs> obviously destroy, seek, destroy some more, ah, kill. Like I mean, it's not that I was overwhelmed. It's just more or less of just you know I'm wondering like you know when that team, aka Joaquin's team, will be picking somebody that isn't always just about seeking and destroying. I mean, I hear that, but I think that, I mean, you know, it's, it's always, I think characters uh, or their teams rather sort of take on the, take on the characteristics of their, their captain. Leader, <laughs> their captain, yes. So, I mean, it, it just may be a function of the Native American uh, delegation having, you know, having an eye, uh, finding these characters in the various universes and, and going, you know. Honing in. Well, I, I, I mean, I understand that, like, um, as in America as a whole, I think when you see, like, you know, an old Western with, like, Native Americans in there, it's a lot of, like, you know, seek out and destroy and kill and, you know, a lot of violence. But I think that there's a lot more to the Native American culture, as, you know, I'm sure Joaquin would agree. And I just, I don't know, I just wanted to see, like, a pick where you know, it brings something else to the table. Which is, I can definitely you know, respect that. A yeah. different aspect. I can definitely respect that. I'd love to hear from some of the listeners who might be of Native American. Um, yeah, I'd love to hear their perspectives on it. Feel free to write in uh, racial draft podcast at Gmail um, or just hit us under um, on, on Twitter or Facebook under our uh, posts and we'll, we'll, we'll definitely signal boost uh, anything that you might want to add in that respect. Um, Martin, do you have any uh, additional thoughts on that? Not really. No. All right. uh, yeah. All right. So let's you know let's move on to the third pick of round nine, and that was uh, the Polynesian team. Our old friend Tomati. Um, he uh, he he decided to draft Valkyrie. Um, now, the tricky thing about this draft, the tricky thing about this draft is that. He specifically uh, chose. He specifically chose the Valkyrie that was played by Tessa Thompson. Mm-hmm. So um, I think. I mean, there there has been back and, a little bit of back and forth as to whether the Tessa Thompson Valkyrie is uh, canonically the same as uh, Brunhilde from the Marvel comics, um, who at, at this point happens to be dead. <laughs> But uh, you know, Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie is very much alive. So, uh, you know, as from a from a scoring perspective, um, it, it might be a little bit a little bit fraught right now. What's that you say, Kia? Zero points. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but um, you know, as usual, uh, Tom T is you know less concerned about points and more concerned about narrative, uh, and because of that. I think it only it's only right to do justice to the draft pick uh, by reading the narrative. And apologies in advance because I'm sure I will butcher I will butcher the language, but I, I try I try people. <laughs> um, the source of all things is Io. It is Io who created the universe and the infinite realities and dimensions within. At the beginning, Io created two internal energies. Those energies would take form. One of these forms was Marakura. The Marakura are the supreme goddesses and protectors of Io. They are also the origin of female energy in the universe. Women warriors trace their descent in a straight line to Marakura. Through the knowledge gained through the generations, these societies are able to tap into the source of this godly power. Two well-known female warrior societies of groups to tap into this energy are the Amazons and the Valkyrie. Arahira was a Valkyrie, one of a select group of women raised and trained in Asgard to protect Odin. She was born with the abilities of an Asgardian, but was different. She was chosen from her generation to personify the power of the Marakura. The combination of these enhanced powers, discipline, and training made her the most powerful of the Valkyrie. 
in a battle in Midgard, Earth 616, Araha, sorry, <laughs> Arahia and the Valkyrie mm -hmm. joined a battle against the Frost Giants. They had created a portal from Jotunheim, landing in Antarctica. Their purpose was to colonize Earth and change it to a new ice world. However, Namor intervened, and with the might of Teorio Changoria, the descendants of Tangoria, fought the Frost Giants. Alongside the Valkyrie, Namor and his people won the battle and saw the Frost Giants retreat to Jotunheim. Arahia was intrigued by the ferociousness, fearlessness, and sense of purchase, purpose displayed by Namor. After spending time with Namor, she identified that they shared a descent to the gods. They were both protectors and warriors. Namor saw his purpose to fight against oppression by any means. Arahia, along with Maia Monroe, Storm, would serve as an anchor for Namor to pick his battles and fight alongside him. Arahia would become a confidant to Namor, a mentor to Utopia, and a powerful member of the team. Arahia, warrior, Valkyrie. You know what? I think he gets half a point for being able to add in one of his other picks in that story. Ooh-wee. I mean, I, I feel like Tamati generally well inter, uh, interweaves the narratives of the characters that he drafts in previous rounds. It's one of the reasons that he's such a beloved storyteller. Um, I, I mean, you know, I'm sure Tamati, if he can hop in, will, would tell us that he's, uh, you know, crafting a, a counter narrative, a little bit different from what we're what we're all about broadly on in the racial drafts. But it's it's still it's still all in fun. It's still great. Um, the picks are the picks. The stories are the stories, and uh, and we always welcome the creative creativity. Um, as far as, like I said, as far as trying to square the circle of the Valkyrie of the movies and the Valkyrie of the books and, uh, where, where exactly this reimagined Valkyrie fits, uh, that's, that's an exercise for another day. But overall, I mean, I love the character. I love what Tessa Thompson's done in the role. I'm curious to see what she's going to do in the future movies, um, you know, Thor 4. So, I mean... You know, sadly, the black delegation has taken on another L. And um, although I guess, I guess technically Tessa Thompson is biracial, um, so maybe that's an L for you, Kia. <laughs> nah, not at all. As a front runner, yeah. As a front, I mean, Cyclops. That pick, yeah, more points on the Cyclops end. I, I think I did right. I, I feel you there. You're 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 all you're all about the points. I got it. Um, but um, yeah. I, one thing that I've noticed actually is that I feel like a lot of Tamati's picks have actually not been white characters. Um, they've been they've been other characters of color. Um, so it's 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 an interesting, it's an interesting approach that Tamati's making. I, I never would have expected any of the other teams to primarily draw from. Uh, draw from the backgrounds uh, of uh, high profile, high profile characters of other ethnicities. So you're keeping us on our toes. We, just, we don't, we don't just have to worry about the white delegation. We also have to worry about the Polynesian team. Take note. Mm -hmm. so, Take but note. they're like doing it like low key, so nobody really notices. Whereas the white team is like, no, I'm the villain, straight up. Well, yeah, I mean, People. they're, they're, you know, the white team is all about, all about that colonizing. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what do you think about this, Martin? I, I feel like we should save that for later. <laughs> we, there is more to there is much more to say in a couple picks. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> which brings us to the which brings us to the Asian delegation. The Asian delegation, I thought they came with a really strong pick. They picked Johnny Storm, the human torch. Um, you know, one of the members of the first family, of course. Yeah. What did you think of about the Human Torch pick, uh, Martin? I like the Human Torch pick, yeah. Um, you know, um, as I mentioned on, on Twitter, like, ah, uh, yes, Filipinos, the Latinx of Asia. So it kind of just fit kind of well, and, like, I completely understand it. And again, first family, very obviously someone else that we may, maybe were thinking of because we already had a sister. Um, but yeah, points wise, again, I'm also a very points wise person for the most part. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and yeah, I definitely can agree with that pick. Fantastic Four is always like in the forefront of a lot of stuff. Right. So he's definitely gonna definitely gonna be a good person to get. And now that just leaves one Fantastic Four member left. Right. And and you know, you know, not to not to be overly stereotypical, but like yeah. I feel like you know, had a Johnny Storm that's Latinx is like, I mean, the, the jokes are right there as far as like being hot, hot headed and hot blooded, right? <laughs> like it was. Yeah, I mean, I get that because I I'm I'm a similar way. Like I have, I've I've been the anger management therapy actually. Mm. Uh, I take after my dad in that way. We there's a saying. I'm gonna translate it. Mm -hmm. uh, we like we rise up kind of like beer bottles, kind of like so like se suben como la cerveza. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So it's like we're very quick to like get anger for high headed people. We're passionate. Right. Uh, that's probably a better way to put it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no. Johnny Storm, I definitely like that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, so so it was a little bit a little bit unexpected, uh, but as usual. The Asian delegation does come with strong picks um, every time out. They've had to make a couple defensive picks because they they peep game on the Polynesian team before everyone else did. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. uh, probably being you know the pick right after the Polynesian team, they were you know had seen some of their, their <coughs> get get scoped out. But um, yeah, so so th so this was this was one of the stronger picks in the Whoa, that is background noise. But um, one of, the, one of the stronger picks in the ninth round, and I'll try to do justice to to the backstory. Many people comment that the Latinx community and the Filipino community have a lot in common. Here, Sue, previously drafted by the Latinx delegation, and Jonathan Santos Storm are siblings. Like his older sister, Johnny always felt invisible. Johnny also always felt invisible as a Filipino American in the U.S. Despite the fact that there are over 4 million Filipino Americans in the U.S., making them the third largest group of Asian Americans, they are largely ignored in media and pop culture. While Sue's powers reflect the invisibility of Latinx in the U.S., Johnny's powers went the other way, making him a living flame who cannot be ignored anymore. Johnny has a fierce sense of loyalty to his family and a desire to help others. He also holds as a high-profile superhero in one of the most famous superhero families who give Filipino Americans a hero to be proud of. You know, I, think it, I thought it was very succinct, um, good explanation. I didn't do a lot of reinventing the wheel as far as the backstory is concerned. Uh, acknowledged the Sue Storm pick and, um, you know, ready to go, ready to ready ready-made backstory where, where we sort of jump right in. He gets, basically, I assume he keeps all of the qualities that we associate with Johnny Storm. Um, and um, yeah, you know, John Johnny Santos Storm right there for us. Uh, do you have any final thoughts about uh, Human Torch, Kia? I think it was just a really strong pick. And, you know, I'm, I'm continuing to wait and see what their next pick is going to be. They're a team that I like to like see, you know, what's going to happen every week. Yeah, you, you feel them nipping at your heels as the front runner, don't you? Uh, I wouldn't say that. I, I, you know, but I do see them like or feel them, you know, staring at my back. All right. I'm going to leave that one right alone. But... <laughs> you could have taken it there, but you didn't. <laughs> no, I have too much respect for you. Oh, you're so sweet. Now that brings us to the Jewish delegation. Yeah, Annie, you're a great captain. Woo! Okay, all right, continue. <laughs> so with the fifth pick, in round nine of the racial draft, the Jewish delegation selected Zatanna. Now, uh, Martin, you're a, Z you're a DC head. Yeah. What, what, are you, what, is, what were your thoughts on the Zatanna pick? I love that pick. Uh, I know on, on Twitter I said uh, jokingly my favorite was Def because I picked it, but in all honestly, Zatanna is my favorite one of this round. Uh, points wise, again, very good. Uh, I'm familiar with her with like uh, some. I've, I've read some stories of Zatanna. I've liked it. Uh, I've seen her in other media, and you know, like maybe she's gonna get a little bit more exposure because you know, like of the HBO Max show, the Justice League mm -hmm. Dark show. 
Yeah, definitely a very, very good pick. Someone that I wanted to maybe try and get. And me being me, I had an entire thing written up already for Zidana. And then I had to delete it as soon as the Jewish delegation got her. So that was that hurt a little. But, uh, yeah, like this late in the game to get someone like Zatanna, I got to give Annie all the props. Yeah, and Zatanna is one of those characters, you know, she has an iconic look. Now, she may not be A-list in terms of mainstream people knowing about her, but I think once they, they're introduced to her, you know, there, there's, a, there's a pretty good upside for her. If she's introduced in a good way, either in HBO Max or in the movies, you know, I could see... I can see her 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 profile um, increasing in the next few years. Yeah, I hope so. They nail the casting, of course. Yeah. Uh, obviously, the Jewish delegation would hope they would cast someone Jewish. <laughs> Makes sense. Right. But um, Kia, what were your thoughts about Zatanna? I actually don't that know that much about Zatanna, but I did like the pick. I think that. You know, Annie's strategy, like in terms of picking each round, is really great. And I like to see, once again, another female represented. And I think Annie's one of the best people to do so. And uh, yeah, if you could share her backstory. Did she give a backstory this week? Yes, she did. But uh, at first, I was just going to give you a little bit, a little bit more about Zatanna, uh, mainstream Zatanna. She's yeah, been, I would love to know. She's been around since the 60s. Um, she is the daughter of the magician Giovanni John Zatara, who's been in the books since way back in Action Comics number one. So he is, he is, he's old school. And uh, she's basically, uh, in a sense, a legacy character being, being his daughter. And, you know, she, she was an illusionist before she uh, inherited sort of true, ma true magic. She has a history with... Uh, she has a history with Batman. Um, what I didn't know, but I guess I should have known, is that her costume is uh, the top. The top part is inspired by her father's costume, and uh, you know, then she brought the fishnet leggings to the table. So I mean, while I'm sure that I pro there were probably some male uh, male artists who who f who came up with that, um, it it has really gone a long way to making her look her look fairly iconic. Um, you know, she's, she's, she's appeared fairly frequently in storylines involving Batman. She's been in, uh, I believe she was in Justice League Dark. Um, yeah, she's certainly in Justice League Dark. Yeah, she's in Justice League Dark. Um, she has uh, relationships, you know, um, professional <coughs> relationships with John Constantine. Um, I believe she's been in the Justice League as well. Um, so, yeah, she's, 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 got, she's got some... She's got some cloud around the DC universe. And, um, you know, she's not quite, not quite Dr. Strange level, but, you know, give her time. However, Annie had, Annie decided to give us a fairly extensive backstory and I'd like to do that backstory justice. Um, also, uh, welcome back to the uh, further uh, co-captain slash representative um, to the Jewish delegation, uh, Adam, aka Check the Circuit on Twitter. Um, he's, you know, welcome. He, he was, you know, had to take some time off, but he's back and he's part of the community and just wanted to give him a little shout uh, as a member of the community. Um, but yeah, so they, uh, there was a little bit of collaboration in the backstory, but I think it was mostly Annie on this one. Zahara Zatara was born in San Francisco, but let's go back a bit. It is well known that the only thing ever interesting about Spain were the Moors and the Jews. And after the Moorish conquest, under the Moorish rule, Jews arrived and thrived in Spain, recognized as people of the book by Al-Andulas, Al trading all the way through Central Asia and back, building great foundations of art, learning, and commerce. They were not equal to the Moors. It was far better than the vicious repression of the Visigoths. And then there was the magic. Jews were among the homo magi, but various active and contemplative Kabbalistic traditions were secretive and practiced <clears throat> covertly by necessity under various Jewish laws. In 1492, a thoroughly cursed year by world history standards, Ferdinand and Isabella issued the al, al Hamra decree and, also, and so a branch of Jewish homo magi, rather than submit to the Spanish Christian tyranny, torture, murder, or conversion, 
rather than become Moranos, gladly fled. The Sultan Bayezid, by, sorry, the Sultan Bayezid II shifts when they arrived to rescue Jewish refugees, sailing them to the safety of the Ottoman Empire, where they stayed a while. The Zatara is practicing as professional magicians while honoring their spells and deepening their knowledge of the intrinsic nature. Eventually, Zahara's father brought his wife, Sindela, to San Francisco. Zahara, which means bright one, was born shortly thereafter. After the death of her mother, Zahara's father settled in the height, making a living performing magic while working as a de facto magical investigator. Zahara loved growing up in Baghdad by the bay, trained by her father from childhood. She knew that she had a larger destiny, although she re reveled in magical research. Her precision and control increased to the point that it was soon clear that she had not outgrown her San Francisco career. Eventually, this handsome Latinx Superman shows up in the press, and who is this pretentious, dramatic Batman character, preying on people's fears and beating up people for traffic tickets? Tahara eventually joins the Justice League, becoming an indispensable source of magical heroism and magical divination of where to get the best Boyuz and Lara move. Now, for our friend, uh, she actually had a fan cast, and that fan cast was the uh, Indian sound uh -huh. film era actress Ruby Myers. Um, obviously, it, this would not be an actual fan cast as she is uh, no longer with us, but I would imagine she means artistically. So, uh, Art, um, Eli, if you're out there, you know, you've got some reference images if you want to illustrate uh, the new Zatanna. She's right there for us in Ruby Myers. Kia, you said that you were a fan of this backstory? Very much so. I thought it was quite thorough and, you know, really creative once again. But, you know, I'm, I, you know, whenever Annie does do a backstory, it always surprises me and, you know, just kind of puts a smile on my face. So does that make you want to jump in and do some Zatanna readings? I actually do. I'm, I'm actually more intrigued by the character. So I, I will be doing my research. That sounds good. Sounds great. Uh, Martin, you have any final thoughts about Zatanna? No, I'm just going to reiterate. Uh, I really like this one. That's the only thing I really got to say. I, I'm going to be, I'm just going to, mostly I think I'm going to be here and just be a pretty face. <laughs> well, oh, it's not going to be hard. Oh, he's so cute. Well, that brings us to the white delegation. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the white delegation was here last week, and he put some characters in on the poll for us. I believe they were uh, John Stewart, Cassandra Cain. Um, Manifold. Manifold. And the one that the people agreed on, which was Jaime Reyes, a.k.a. the Blue Beetle. I mean, I didn't agree with it, but okay. <laughs> so, uh, Hi! Hey, Annie. We're just uh, we're, we're going through the picks. Uh, we have a special guest, guys. This is Annie of the Jewish delegation. We just finished talking about, we were singing the praises of the Zatanna pick. So would you like to say a few more things about Zatanna? Oh, my God. I'm on the spot so quickly. <laughs> yes, Annie! <laughs> Hi. Um, I'm going to be walking around as I do this. Um, so uh, what did you guys want to know? I'm so sorry that I joined late. No problem, no problem. Just, you know, just whatever you want to say, whatever you just to elaborate on, on the pick, like what inspired it, um, just kind of like how you see the character interacting with the rest of the characters, you know, in the universe, maybe some of the other draft picks, just your, anything that, anything you feel like you want to contribute as the architect of the pick. Of course. Well, first of all, this is Annie AKA Fangirl Smash, perpetually high strung comics tweeter, <laughs> and uh, captain of the co captain of the Jewish delegation. Um, so I wanted to give Sephardic representation, and again, to emphasize Jews of color in the draft this week for the Jewish team. I knew that I wanted to pick a magical character, and I wanted to tie her to. Jewish traditions of magic, which traditionally have been very underground or very esoteric, um, because uh, after a certain point in Jewish history, Jews were basically not practicing magic. Um, 
And of course, the Kabbalah continued to be a mystical tradition that divided into many, many different sub um, genres of mystical contemplation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we know there's a history of Jewish magic users. And so I wanted to keep, well, Adam pointed out, the, the co-captain of the Jewish team, that Zatanna is already Jewish in the Bombshells universe. Interesting. So I wanted to tie her um, to Moorish Spain, because when the Jews and the Moors arrived in Spain, again, shout out to the Latinx team, I was lovingly trolling you guys, um, that you know the Moors and the Jews are what made Spain, Spain interesting during that period of time. And the Jews um, really thrived and prospered under Islamic rule. And so I wanted to tie Zatanna's origin to that, Zohara's origin to that by making her a Sephardic Jew, someone who was descended from Sephardic Jews that were driven out of Spain during the Inquisition or forced to convert. And um, Jews that were forced to convert are called Maranos, which is a slur. Forgive the mispronunciation. Um, <laughs> I see you, Team Latinx. <laughs> um, so I wanted to tie her uh, to that origin. And a lot of what I wrote is actually factual. Um, when the Jews were expelled from Spain over a period of decades, when the Alhambra degree was handed down, um, Sultan Bayazid II of the Ottoman Empire literally said, what a fool, they're driving out the jewels of the Spanish Empire, the Jews, the Jews. So he sent his ships, he literally sent his ships to take the Jewish refugees from Spain to the Ottoman Empire. And from there, some of them stayed in Turkey, some of them moved through the Balkans, some of them became... Um, what we call Bukharan Jews. Anyway, so Zatanna comes from that lineage and she's got a tradition of Jewish magical history that she knows and understands and that is very esoteric, but she's also homo magi, meaning that she's of magical stock. So that's what I went with. Um, and I tried to then keep her origin and story pretty congruous with what we already know that she uh, grew up and was trained by her dad um, and that she's obviously an extremely powerful magic user um, and I wanted when I picked a fan cast I know that we've really been going with glamorous fan casts and I kind of wanted to throw in there that <coughs> Jews Jews actually started the film industry in India. Not many people know that. And then they were later driven out. So I wanted to fan cast Ruby Myers, who was this amazing, very sexy at the time, um, Jewish actress who was one of the, who was a star in India um, in the early phases, the early era of the Indian film industry. Um, so I went, I fan cast Ruby Myers because she was really intense looking, very beautiful, very Jewish looking. <laughs> there we have it. Gotcha. And, and how I see her um, interacting with the other teams, I'm sure she's gonna be curious about Latinx Superman when he shows up. Um, I think she's going to go, she's going to want to go talk to him and she's going to want to go find the other magic users in the DC universe, like Constantine, um, Enchantress, Cersei, etc. So I think she's able to go toe to toe with everyone else in the DC universe in terms of magic use. Right. Um, now, now, forgive me, I'm, I'm not that well read on uh, with Zatanna. Does she have uh, uh, some sort of like crush, so to speak? With on Superman, I think she might. <laughs> okay. I was, yeah, I was wondering. I was wondering about that. <laughs> she might. She might. I've gone ahead and inserted Zatanna, and I'm doing what Sean's doing. I'm taking the prerogative of making a shared universe. <laughs> um, so I think uh, she's going to be curious, and she's going to want to know who this elusive Batman figure is that's running around being well, extremely dramatic. I've definitely read stories where um, where Batman and Zatanna have had some shared history, um, you know, where I think Batman in his days of previous training before when he's Bruce Wayne, just learning, you know, the full allotment of skills that he gets to have as being Batman. Um, he took some magic 
and I think trained under her father at, at one point. So well, um, oh, I was just going to say there's there's a troubled history between in the comics between Satana and Bruce uh, because of that whole brain not brainwashing um, mind wipe thing that she did. So they've had a very troubled relationship in the comics, and it seems like. To the best of my knowledge, it's it's only recently in the past few years that he's kind of come around and warmed up to her again. Mm -hmm. um, but I, if anything, um, that's that's a very fraught relationship in the comics, and I am not sure that a Jewish Zatanna would be mind wiping Batman. Completely unethical. Right. <laughs> yeah, we're, I mean, we'll we'll have to, you know, this is something I had talked about in the group, you know, in, when we sort of re, recreate the canon, as it were, um, at, at when the draft is complete, figuring out what things kind of change, what what the ripples are of the various picks in the in the universes. So that's going to be that's going to be an interesting thing to say. I mean, think, yeah, thing to see rather. I was going to say that also. I think that a Jewish Zatanna is going to be more ca more careful with her magic use. Mm. Um, she's going to be deeply, deeply concerned with the ethics of magic use coming from a Sephardic Jewish tradition and how she weaponizes magic um, and what she does with it. And also, I imagine that if she also uses Kabbalistic magic, along with the other magic that she's trained in, it's going to look really cool. All right. Well, I mean, since you're here now, um, we, we, we went through all the previous picks. So, you know, if you can just give us sort of your one sentence or one or two sentences on the previous picks, the Cyclops pick, for instance. Wonderful. Wonderful. We now have a multiracial Jewish Summers Gray family, I'm sure. Nathaniel is <laughs> getting ready to centrifuge that summer's grade DNA right now. Uh, what about the carnage pick? Loved it. Loved it. I would have loved to see more, a little bit more of a backstory. Yeah, from, but, what, I, from what I heard, there was a lot more blood and guts in the original draft of the backstory. Uh, yes. When I read the backstory, it was extremely blood and guts. Um, it's it's a real i thought it was a really heavy heavy violent character to pick yeah i mean i mean he's a pretty violent character so, i mean he's pretty much defined by it yeah he's a he's a, he's a psychopath um and I, I thought the fan cast was really good and the naming the nomenclature making his name the snake literally mm -hmm. Wasn't like, isn't one of his quotes, it's like, he was saying like, you know, I, you know, you like do something in the dark, but I was created by the dark or something like that. You're thinking of Bane. Oh. You're thinking of Bane. <laughs> oh, sorry. There's just so many characters that are just so violent. I, I got him confused. Yeah, that, My bad. I, that, was, I, that was last round. That was last I was I wallow in the darkness. Wallow in it. Mm -hmm. I am the night. You simply adopted the darkness. I was born in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still pissed that they whitewashed Bane for, for the Dark Knight Rises. Thanks a lot, Nolan. But anyway, what <laughs> and the next pick? And that one the next one was uh, Valkyrie. That was um Tomatee's Valkyrie pick. Yeah, well, you know, I, as I said on Twitter, I think Tomati is playing fifth dimensional chess and we're playing two dimensional chess. He's really far ahead of us in terms of creating a holistic integrated team and mapping out their relationships really, really carefully and thoroughly. So, you know, Tomati always brings it and brings it hard. And... And also, yes, the Human Torch pick. How can I forget the Human Torch pick from the uh, Asian delegation? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I I think that um, I want to say that I really I really love that pick because I really want to see an Asian Johnny Storm be so ebullient and joyous and wisecracking and going up against Ben Grimm. I thought it was a really good pick. Yeah, I agree. 
and that I guess that brings us up to speed. So we can jump in on jump in on the poll results. Uh, let's see let's see what the final what the final result of the poll ended up being. It was it went down to the wire for sure. So so the final results was sixteen percent for Manifold, twenty five percent for John Stewart. So right there uh, proportionally. 28% for Cassandra Cain and 31% for Blue Beetle. Uh, Martin, would you like to say a few words about the pick? Um, well, I was, I, I was dreading it. Uh, I knew it was like, I knew there was a really good chance. It was the second time he wanted Jamie, as he put it, on, on his polls. And I, I, I already made some sort of peace with the fact that uh, we've lost Blue Beetle. But um, I, I'm trying to think of something good to say. <laughs> I, voted, I voted for Manifold. <laughs> I voted for Manifold. I, 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 I would not want it to go with Jon Stewart, you know, Green Lantern and everything. Uh, I didn't want to go Cassandra Kane. I knew the least about Manifold, so therefore I would be like the least torn up about it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, we were all going to lose, man. We were all going to, someone was going to lose. Yeah. And that just ended up being us this time around. Yeah. I mean, he's, I would say he's, you know, top three uh, DC Latinx characters. Wouldn't you, would you uh, agree? Oh, definitely. I definitely feel like. He would be one of the top three. Um, all the ones probably like definitely Bane when they remember he's Latinx. Uh, <laughs> Jessica Cruz, definitely. Oh, right. Definitely. Yeah. Like the amount of exposure, definitely getting a lot of. And I mean, I mean, I want to say Kyle, but they don't remember that he's half yeah. Mexican. So, but like he's he's one of the more prolific ones because he's got like the most like stories of his own and stuff mm -hmm. but like they forget about it and now he's just whereas, oh, whereas, whereas i feel like with jaime he's it's right there in, in yeah stories. it's 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 at the forefront and, and i didn't realize until i looked it up he was only created in 2006 so yeah he's, you know, he's a baby less than 15 years of 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 existence he's he's on that miles morales level of you know meteoric rise i remember literally the first issue and i remember the solicits when it came out in 2006 and the announcements that there was going to be a new blue beetle and how the comic community reacted so i i was so excited yeah and um you know, I, I think he, he was he was on you know in live action adaptations very quickly. Um, I remember seeing him on Smallville, and yep. he was in uh, you know obviously Young Justice. He he gets a pretty prominent storyline, you know, uh, as far as animated adaptations. So it's it's kind of a shame that he doesn't have a an ongoing book right now in DC. Yeah. Um, so as far as a scoring pick um, for for Sean. It may not be a, it may not be a lot. What, what's that? What's that, Kia? What's your phrase? Zero points. <laughs> <laughs> Kia's the front runner. We have to remember, Kia is the front runner. So that there's, there's a possibility that uh, we can take solace in in whitewashing, not yielding, not yielding a lot of points for for uh, the white team. Amen. Yeah, that's something I I definitely was like. Well, at least he's, I mean, it's not, it's not like he's being used in anything. Smiley face, sad emoji. <laughs> <Follow that. laughs> Although, now that he's been whitewashed. <laughs> no, he'll, still not. He'll just decide all of a sudden, DC will be like, really? <laughs> 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 ja Jamie Reese, Jamie Reese, this new, this new white character. Let's, let's, get, I, him in the, let's get him in the Teen Titans. I, yeah. I, I, I think that, that Sean is actually being really gracious and very good about being the villain turn, being the heel turn in this whole collaborative project of ours. He's really doing a good job. I agree. Every he, story needs a villain. And he brought us he brought us a backstory which I have to give him, you know, do justice for. Is everybody ready? 
Dan Garrett would have sought those he, he, sorry, Dan Garrett would have sought those he thought escaped justice, dressed up as the Blue Beetle, a silly persona his son had made up for him as a kid. He died a local hero to the boys in blue, who took up the Blue Beetle logo as their new badge, alongside a stance to oppress harder, like Dan would have. The Scarab was an exalted outcast amongst their people, the Reach. It was destined to be the conqueror of unknown lands, but the Scarab desired to escape this colonizing narrative and the oppression of the Reach. This desire sent them across the galaxy, further than any other. The Scarab thought they had found aid with the Green Lantern Corps, but the, the, the Guardians turned out to be cons complicit in the action of the Reach. The Scarab was shot down by one of the numerous Green Lanterns of Sector 2814. Jamie J James Reese recently lost his estranged father. With Dan gone, James and his mother moved back to Fox City to be closer to his family. The police force were not happy to see them return and made it a struggle for the entire Reese family to get by. One day, James discovered the Scarab. James was sympathetic to its plight and they unite to fight against the injustice. He took the name Blue Beetle to reclaim it from the actions of the police, unaware of the larger problems of the Reach, the true nature of the Scarab and just how close the apple fell from the tree. He even provided a fan casting of Nolan Gould as uh, James Reese. Bravo, Sean. Well done. So well Sean, done. You know, Sean came with a, with a, a quality whitewash and uh, a, a backstory to support the whitewash. Um, I would expect nothing less from Sean. I think this is the only project in popular media where we are actually for whitewashing or <laughs> applauding whitewashing of certain characters. I mean, we're not applauding it. No, we're just we're, we're appreciating admiring the creation. admiring the admiring the chutzpah. Yes, yes. If, if you guys could see Martin's face right now, he is not pleased. <laughs> not pleased. <laughs> I mean, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast so that we can we can in in. Uh, what passes for person see the anguish of of what it's like because I felt it I I've, I've I have I have been on the other side of a Sean whitewash so I understand yeah okay do you have any more thoughts about uh, the blue beetle pick well played Sean well played so I guess I guess it's time to talk about the uh, the black team mm-hmm they uh, drafted the one above all, who is uh, ah. now yeah. you, you have some familiarity with the one above all. Um, yes, I do. I actually put him in my poll like twice, I think. Two different polls. But, uh, you know, the black delegation just went right for it. The, I think they're reaching. I think, you know, they're trying to make up for, you know other picks that maybe weren't that great. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Can I also interject here that I felt like I'm the one that may have started this appendage swinging contest <laughs> by picking the Living Tribunal and then <laughs> boys are boys are mad and I'm joking of course. Boys are mad that girls leveled up. Yeah, I, mean, I, I agree. I agree with you Annie 100%. Thank you. Well I mean now that now that it's a swinging contest, uh, and uh, and now that they're learning that the girls swing a lot lower than the rest, yeah, the the black <laughs> decided that they had to find had to find the biggest name. <laughs> but but also, team. it's a really good assist to the Jewish team because we all know Jack Kirby is the one above all. So the one above all is a black Jew. Thank you for the assist. Woo woo! Uh, black Kirby, as it were. Blurby. <laughs> <laughs> Blurby sounds like a toy. It really does. <laughs> what kind of toy? We won't talk about. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> just in time for Thomas. My first thing was like just Thomas. Kirby, like a pretty good character. Uh, we That's where we went. Another surprise guest, Tomachi. Say what's up to the people. Or maybe not. Oh, uh, hey, guys. Hey, can there you? we go. We can hear you. Yeah. So just we're just having just problems with my camera, but. Please keep talking. Yeah, so we're, you know, so we were going pick by pick. We were up to the black delegation's choice of the one above all. Wow. <laughs> Poor Tomaty. <laughs> yeah. His, your reactions were priceless. 
Well, I mean, since you're here, you know, we, we did the same for Annie. We, we asked, asked you to just give like one or two sentences on the, the picks that came before. You know, what were your thoughts about the Cyclops pick? Um, that, that was actually probably my, <clears throat> apart from my own, probably the, the favorite, my favorite pick of the round. <laughs> Okay. Oh my God! What? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Shall I shall I explain why? <laughs> yeah, go for yes, it. Yes, please go. Like take forever. Go ahead. Um, it's a strange thing. I mean, you know, seeing the injustice that's kind of um, befallen, you know, a character like Cyclops in the well, now it's part of the MCU. Um, I've kind of thought, oh, man, we we need to, we need to. Say again? <laughs> we need to reclaim and redeem him somehow. Yeah, I kind of think so, eh? Um, whereas, but then again, <laughs> then I think about how he's, he is the, he's the, he's the daddy of everything in the comic books, right? As far as mutants are concerned. So um, I can't feel too, too sorry for him, but um, more than anything else, I was just glad that he got selected because he's one of those characters that um, I feel like could have gone in the earlier rounds and that he's fallen all the way to, to nine. Uh, was was surprised. So I think as far as um, yeah, favorite picks, he was he was mine for for this round. Now this it was hopefully no one gets feelings about that. What about my pick? What about my pick? Yeah. Well, um, we'll if anything, you... if oh. anything, this Scott Summers is going to be probably a whole lot less uptight. Yeah, I mean for he'll, sure he'll be uptight in his own way because. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of his defining characteristics, but we'll, we may have more of an understanding of why he's so uptight, and I think that's really important. Um, what, is you, what about your what about the Carnage pick, Tomati? Oh, that's a fantastic pick. I mean, um, but we spoke about this last week as well with um, all of Joaquin's Joaquin's picks. There's a definitely a consistent um, uh, there's a consistency across all all of the characters. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, there were, you know, there um, there's a a dark a dark side to all of his characters, a dark kind of a, a violent streak to the characters, and, and this is um, alpha I'm all for that. Apex. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And so, just to see that personify, I mean, the perfect personification of that is is Carnage. So, it made sense when I saw it. So, you know, great pick. I mean, for for the native team, I thought. And of course, you know, if you want to give any additional color on your pick. Of um, I, <clears throat> I guess my my question is, what was I mean? Basically, throw it back over to the team and ask um, what people's uh, feelings were about the pick, and then I can perhaps talk to that. Um, I think yeah, I think the response was 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 fairly positive. You know, I think we all love the backstory. You know, as always, that is your forte. The uh, the the backstory that weaves. Um, you know the the cultural elements and the the sort of additional layers to the character. I mean, I th I don't think anyone had anything uh, bad to say about the pick in that respect. Obviously, I had I sort of made a joke. About, um, you you were very interested in the Tessa Thompson incarnation of of, uh, of Valkyrie. <laughs> Who wouldn't be? Right. I understand. <laughs> Tom <Tomatee. laughs> I yeah, really I mean, loved, sorry. Oh, I, like I said just a few minutes ago before you got here and on Twitter, you're playing fifth dimensional chess and the rest of us peons are wallowing around thinking it's only two dimensional world. I really, I really loved it. Um, I, I admit the last two stories, backstories that Tomati has written have made me cry. Oh, wow. Yeah, they really have. And actually, there, I, I there's Tomati touching people again. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I, and, you know, unfortunately, I was remiss. I, I, I left out the fan cast, and this is a great opportunity for you to explain the fan cast, Tomati. Yeah, um, it's, I mean, coming back to the thing around selecting um, uh, Tessa, Tessa Thompson as, as uh, the reimagining of. Of, of the Valkyrie, um, to be fair, I was, I was kind of looking for someone, you know, um, or moving away from the kind of Brun, Brunhild um, depiction of her. And I think Tessa Thompson is a, a fantastic example of that. And so <clears throat> having 
kind of scanning the fan art and, and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean, it was the closest uh, I could, well, the best depiction I could find. As far as the fan cast is concerned, um, Afina, um Rose Ashby is a, a young actress, um, of course, based here in, in New Zealand, who's done a lot of local stuff. But again, she, um, I have just from what I've seen of her work, she definitely carry the role. Um, the both the physicality, but also the uh, the vulnerable aspects of of the Valkyrie as well. Mm. Um, and I think where I, if I had to guess, I think people probably um, were connected to to the backstory because of um, I try as much as possible as you've seen to weave in uh, traditional stories from from of course from my from my culture into that and one of those and it's something I've actually spoken to Annie about in the past was around uh, the Māori Kura and in our traditions it was the create they were the first uh, female element in the universe yes uh, but, they're, but they're also the protectors of of the supreme being <laughs> so you know they are if you know bringing it into this universe I, I mean to the Marvel universe and stuff like that I think they would be the equivalent of the the celestials right um, along that power set so but and then the one thing I tried to tie in, tie into the Valkyrie is that they are or dis, they have a they can trace a straight line descent um, to the Mare Kura along with the Amazons you notice I would have <clears throat> I checked the Amazons in there too you know societies of warrior women I wonder if yes. you in your hand for a future pick um, sort of laying a, 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 a breadcrumb for for later Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, I try to put some Easter eggs in there um, throughout. So, so yeah, so um, that was, uh, again, when the draft first started, this was a character I kind of already uh, always had in mind. Mm -hmm. And it was just a matter of um, creating the narrative around that to, uh, to weave into, into my team. Um, so again, uh, I mean, talking about consistency, I hope that you'd see there's, there has been a consistency and, and a weaving together of the stories and the characters as well. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I, who knows? May get some points in the fantasy comic league, but may not either. But that's that's cool. I'm cool with that. Right. I think you're going to get points. I think Val you're going to get points. I and did see that um, Valkyrie, um, both Valkyrie and Raven, are uh, set to get some type of films or anyway, more is to happen with those two characters in particular, which is totally totally serendipitous. That was unplanned. Tomati says that his stories are all consistent. Like it's not glaringly obvious. <laughs> it's not glaringly obvious of all the hard work that went into this and how beautifully, beautifully holistic your team is. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Uh, what did you think about the Johnny Storm Human Torch pick? Johnny Storm was someone <laughs> I, I also had on my list pretty early on. If, you, if we go back... I think I might have had him when um, we were creating the poll in front of the first, uh, first couple of your, rounds. I think it was in your first poll, the one which Storm won. He was. Yes. So he was, def he was definitely on, on my list. And, you know, um, and kind of as we went on, I decided to switch him out for a Celestial. I mean, for a, I'm sorry, for a Herald. So I uh, put Fire Lord in his place. But yeah, no, he was on my radar pretty early on, I'm, but uh, a I'm great pick. The draft would have gone if, we, if it had Tom Tomati Tomati has had a consistent theme of fire in many of our discussions about heroes <laughs> from the comics. <laughs> this is true. This is true. <laughs> so I want to know: Is there a secret history of arson somewhere in the background? Or <laughs> I'm joking. I couldn't possibly say. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, so um, I thought it was a great pick. Um, what did others think? As far as Johnny Storm. Yeah, I think we were we were all fans. I especially like the way that. Um, you know, he, he they acknowledged the um, the the what's the, the previous pick of Sue Storm. And, right. Oh, right. And the Adam. the Filipino and Spanish yes. uh, connection as well, which is great. Right. That was great. And uh, so the now so Annie Annie had the fifth pick with Zatanna. Uh, what did you think of that pick? Again, it was an, someone else who was um, on my list. Um, as you, I mean, like I said, going right back to uh, the Scarlet Witch pick, um, further on down the track, I always wanted to have someone that she could she could mentor or represented uh, something that she could, uh, a person that she could help to mentor or grow. 
mm-hmm. as Zatanna was on the list as one of those. Um, I, I eventually, not settled, but I eventually um, selected Raven uh, to be that person. And it fit nicely with the story. So um, again, Zatanna is a fantastic pick, a potentially powerful pick, I think. Um, and from what the little I know about kind of developments around Zatanna coming up, I think she's going to appear a lot uh, in the coming future as well. So I thought it was a, a great pick again. Nice, nice work, what, Annie. What did you think of the backstory? The backstory was great. <laughs> I mean, I'm probably the wrong person to ask. I, I, <laughs> I think, I think I, lo- I love when anybody puts a backstory to, to the characters they select. I mean, that's, that's probably of more interest to me than the actual selection itself. Um, Same. I kind of want to know why. What, why, exactly. why would you select them? So, um, yeah, so again, I'm, I'm pretty biased as far as anybody's backstories are concerned because I think they're all great because um, that's the type of thing I want, uh, I like to see. And of course, uh, the, the pick that we, the, sorry, I, I got a little bit sidetracked, guys. Um, <laughs> did you give your thoughts about the, about the Blue Beetle pick? No, not yet. Um, okay. The Blue, it's, it's one of those characters I, I, to be honest, I don't know a lot about, um, but to see, um, just following along in, in Discord too, with um, kind of the, the reasoning behind the backstory uh, that uh, that Sean has developed, um, I found it really interesting that he's he's um, woven into real world stuff, the things yeah. that are happening with with the police in the United States and stuff like that. And so, just to see that <clears throat> he has, uh, it was quite interesting. Now I, I might have misread this, but did he say he's t- tried to take the magic elements out of? the development of the character? Did I read that right? So I, with what I know about the, with what I know about the blue beetle, there's, there's the, there's one blue beetle, um, you know, the, the well-known um, Ted Cord is more tech based. And I believe it was a recent retcon with J, with the Jaime Reyes version that what was thought to be magical was actually the, was alien based. Is that uh-huh. right about that, Martin? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. It, it's on the the reach. Dan Garrett, who's the one that right. um, Sean decided to use to for Jamie's uh, <laughs> death. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that I mean, it was thought to be kind of like magical, like like based on like Egyptian kind of like I think, and uh, he couldn't really get the whole thing to work the entire time. Right. So I think that, like, yeah, if it's always been the reach, he is, and it's like an inheritance thing, then he has kind of taken the magical, quote unquote, aspect out of it. Yeah, I mean, one thing that Mar that Marvel does very often, they they have that thing that you know, any technology that's uh, sufficiently advanced sort of seems magical to uh, mm-hmm. more primitive species. Right. So they, so the, their ability to work that retcon is, is probably um, one of the more innovative aspects of, of what they did with Blue Beetle in, in the mainstream universe. What I like about, um, what I like about this incarn- incarnation of Blue Beetle is that given, you know, like you said, tying it into real world issues in the police, there, there's, it's almost like it's got a little Robocop element to it. Uh-huh. You no, know, uh-huh. like, you know, you have this, you have this kid who's trying not to um, be violent um, in their in the over um, in in the the dealings of of um, justice, and then this alien tech, which may be a little bit more predisposed to um, this. And again, the the blue of the beetle that's been adopted by the cops, um, trying to kind of push push his envelope, you know, turn him into. More violent. That is some, yeah, that's yeah, some yeah, got it, got interesting, it. interesting semiotics there. Interesting. So, uh-huh. um, you know, it, it does, I mean, I think personally, the story would be just as cool if, if it still had Jaime in the, you know, cause, because it, it would, it would add the dimension of, you know, it would add the dimension of a person of color um, who's potentially being corrupted by this uh by this blue um influence but i mean there's still something to the story if, even if it is a white kid uh-huh. to the, the best of my recollection isn't the reach still a hegemonic colonizing species 
and civilization. Yeah, I, that was my understanding. My understanding yeah. was that the scarab um, was damaged and mm -hmm. somewhat set off from the reach, but the reach yes. were trying to kind of get the scarab back and complete their colonization. Is, is, is that, isn't that what, what it was, uh, Jaime? I mean, sorry, <laughs> some Martin. <laughs> no, I get it all the time. I get it. No, that was me thinking. No, but yeah, that is what it was. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's, there's that too. You know, the, it's, it's again, the character's interesting in, even in the whitewash, but I, I, I still, a part of me, part of me is pained by the fact that we, we that, that, the uh, cultural element was lost. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the one above all. I mean, there's not really a lot to say about the one above <laughs> all analytically, um, but you know, feel free to give your give your thoughts. I blame Annie. <laughs> <laughs> she started this. <laughs> I, re I really did. I really did. Yeah. Oh wow. Well, I, I mean. Well, the minute I opened the door to saying that cosmic entities that didn't really have races could have races, <laughs> yeah. and how they're illustrated, you know, then that, that opened up a Pandora's box for sure. It really did. It really did. You're lucky mm -hmm. you didn't get Lord Chaos, <laughs> Master Order, or Master Master Chaos and Lord Order. I am a little disappointed in... Um, in, in Toast's uh, lack of Photoshop, he usually is pretty good about <laughs> adding, adding some kind of uh, Photoshop black element to the character. We, we didn't get an Afro. We didn't get a big Afro on the one above all or, or some dreadlocks. You know, I'm very, you know, that's, that's normally right there. Mm. But, or that big cigar that Jack Kirby always had. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, so, I mean, that, and now that brings us to... The final pick of the ninth round. Uh, this we, we uh, uh, grand grand guest in Martin. Since this was the pick that you architected, uh, give it give it to us. Lay it on us. You want me to read it? Well, I mean, or, or just talk about just, it. Just talk about it. Just go for it. First of all, say tell the people what the pick was, if they if they don't already know. Well, uh, the pick was death. Or like La Santa Muerte, you know, that's the kind of like the way I like to think of her now. Um, couple, yeah, this idea came to me a couple weeks back. Um, and I started getting a little worried when Thanos, when, uh, when Th death was brought up there. It's always this thing of like, oh no, if someone mentions a character recently, then it's so, they're in people's heads. Right. It's just like, I put all this work yeah. into death and I don't want to have to delete that like I did with Zatanna. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I just, I know that like in a lot of times when you see like Mexican culture in media, one of the big things that always gets seen is the other those muertos, you know, day of death. Obviously this doesn't help out that matter because it's basically the exact, the exact same thing. But I felt like the story really could weave well with death by integrating her into the idea of day of the dead. You know, the, the whole thing of like, oh, people put out like favors and offerings for the chance to get uh, an opportunity to see their loved ones again. Well, how about if there actually was a figure right there that could make it happen, you know, and it opened up her, can I say heart? Does she have one? Technically, uh, but it really opened up her to this kind of like the idea that, uh, oh yeah, like like the song says, "Don't fear the reaper," you know, like the like the classic song says. But uh, yeah, I just, like does turning this kind of like embittered cosmic figure who would definitely go to Thanos to be like, "Hey, you seem like you're really good at killing people," or you, I see the potential in that. <laughs> Mm -hmm. you want to do that like and i can teach you everything you know and then just eventually coming across this this whole group of people that don't see her that way that mm -hmm. don't they aren't scared of her they like having her around they worship her and she kind of like gets a sense of community from her you know right yeah 
No, go ahead, Annie. Sorry. I I think aside from my own mm -hmm. draft this week, I think Martin's <laughs> was my favorite. It really was. Um, also, I loved the element, and that was my. I was going to ask a question of weaving in kind of epistemologies and epistemologies and ontologies of uh, cultures and civilizations that view death very differently, very differently. So I, I just love the idea of Santa Morarte connecting with cultures that don't view death in the Western way. Mm -hmm. I agree. I mean, it made me actually think about our, our traditions around, around death and around how death is personified as well. Um, probably similar to many other cultures, we don't have a heaven or a hell. Um, but we do have, we do have a, a being that, who oversees the dead. And I guess it's very, very common, but uh, it is also depicted as a woman um, who is the, uh, the God, the, for all intents and purposes, our goddess of death. Um, how, the story behind the, that, um, that, uh, that, the person, Hine Nui Te Po, is that she was actually the first woman as well in our traditions. Um, so she was both the first and she will be the last woman. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So, so, there's... Um, so yeah, there's definitely like, when I saw the, the death, uh, the draft of death and just how it, the, the, the story behind it, it made, made a whole lot of sense. It's also interesting to me that in comics in general, death is often portrayed as kind and benevolent, death of the endless, death in the Discworld universe, mm. um, and then the death that Martin has recontextualized so beautifully here. Yeah. I was going to say that, you know, it's interesting that in, you know, in generally, death isn't, is, is more in Marvel depicted as a bit of an enigma. Mm -hmm. And I, uh -huh. I like this, I like this version where it, it really gives her more depth and agency and a more complicated um, moral base, um, you know, to where, you know, she, she might feel a sense of guilt even about mentoring Thanos and being his muse, um, you know, despite the fact that he's, you know, despite the fact that he's killing in her name and he's benefiting her in, in one way, given that she has these relationships, these cultures that look upon her as not a bad thing, you know, to be somewhat aligned with a villain might make her ambivalent. Um, it might be one of the origin of the ambivalence that traditionally death shows to Thanos. But um, I mean, I don't know if that, that's what you were thinking, uh, Martin, when you came up with it, but it's something that came came to mind for me. No, yeah. Yeah, the idea of, you know, that now originally being like this very kind of like angry that people are scared of her. So she's kind of like, like pulling herself away and being perfectly okay with someone to kill them, everybody pretty much. And then eventually finding these people that make her feel essentially bad because there are people that are, treat her differently, that treat each other very nicely, that there is value to life. And now she's going to have to deal with kind of the sense of guilt that, oh no, I trained this person, this being over here to be a, a real effective killer. And now I'm kind of have to put up with the consequences of my own actions. Mm. So she's doing Teshuva in a way. What? Uh, teshuva is the is the Jewish concept of um, making things right. Oh, like oh. Of, of yeah, of fixing things. If you've harmed someone, it's a holistic framework for healing <clears throat> and doing penance and um, making sure that things are okay. I have a question: Is anybody watching the new Penny Dreadful that's set? Yeah. I have not gotten a chance to watch mm, it. No. Yeah. Well, I was the only reason I brought it up was for Martin is because Santa Muerte is a character, a legitimate character on the show, and she seems to be portrayed beautifully in a show that is otherwise a total train wreck. Uh, Sorry. Uh, and now is that the one that's being played by um, well, I can't remember her name who played Marjorie on Game of Thrones. 
um natalie dormer natalie yes dormer. yes yeah okay. so for, yes. For, for some reason she's in she's a demon in 1930s los angeles hanging out in you know latinx communities but she's represented as a blonde and red-haired woman in different aspects and it's just it's really like it's kind of a train wreck got it so mm -hmm. should we watch it yeah <laughs> for question. santa muerte yes because okay. there's a big conflict leading up between these two forces of santa muerte and this other demon who are coming into this primal conflict oh. and you know santa muerte is the hero got it so yeah i mean as the as a, i mean we're still somewhat lockdown over here in New York. So as the lockdown continues, I, I'm continuing to mow through uh, the shows that I'm, I'm trying to catch up on. So I'll add it to the list. But I guess that finishes out, I guess that finishes out the ninth round. You guys have any thoughts about, about the round as, as a whole? Um, just as a programming note, we lost Kia. She wasn't feeling well. So, um, you know, it's just, just me and you guys now. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, Kia, feel better. Um, I'm mm. sure. Feel better, hun. We love yeah. you. We love yes, you, Kia. We love you. Love is a strong word. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, do you guys have any just last the sort of overall thoughts about round nine? I tried to make my pick as educational as possible, but also really took care of the backstory. So. But to be honest, this everybody always comes through really, really well in 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 the, as the rounds get more compacted and as time compresses. Um, but actually, Martin, I think you did you did the best job, mm. and me. It's it's me and Martin for a tie. <laughs> yeah, you number one, me very, 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 very close second. One A. Wait, which you? You mean me? Yeah, you. You're like no, you. Uh, you were my favorite round pick of this round, and then <gasps> mine like slightly above. So like we're switched. Actually. Oh, thank you, baby. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate the love. Okay, okay. It's a love <laughs> fest. <laughs> Un unexpected love fest, and I, I, I guess I have to do the key role of, of, uh, holding my nose to this love fest. <laughs> We have to remind everyone that Kia is the leader. She's in the number one spot. She is the front runner. She, yeah. she is. She is. <laughs> um, um, I okay. thought for round nine, I don't know if anyone else noticed, but I, th I mean, it, it was quite, it was pretty, pretty awesome to see that everyone had, you could clearly see the, the, the care that people had put into the backstories. Um, <laughs> more so, I, I think more so this round. And I think it has been building. I mean, I know that there have been people um, who have always had, had put a lot of time and thought into the backstories, but this this round in particular seemed like um, everyone took that a little bit of extra time to um, to fully realize their characters. So, you know, salute to everybody for doing Except that. Except for the so, one above all, I want to know the backstory. Interesting, hey, that the one above all was the one that had the least above all, <laughs> as far as story is concerned. <laughs> um, yeah, that was the, that was you know there was. At one of the things uh, behind the scenes note for the listeners is that we were on a little bit of a time crunch towards the end of the yeah yeah towards the end of the round. You know, we were hitting up hitting up against our deadline. I think it were four picks in the last twenty four hours. So you know, maybe they felt maybe they felt a little bit compressed in terms of in terms of being able to sit on it and craft a, a well defined backstory. They were very proud of the pick, but you know, they they didn't get a chance to really come with with bullet points, but I'm sure right, we've right. got something planned, you know, on the wrap, on the wraparound, as it were, of the 10th round. And uh, that how do you, how do you top the one above all? <laughs> that is my question. That, that is my legitimate question. Have, but I'm not going to say it. Right. I mean, even though you, even though you're here and you, you can, uh, yeah, we're, we'll, we'll, I guess it looks like this week, um, unless, unless anyone, does anyone want to? give uh nominations this time around for the 10th round i assume you guys because you picked first will not be making nominations martin what well, uh yeah no we're um i don't feel comfortable enough to say any nomination but like i'm not captain 
I would have to run that by S. But yeah. I think even if even if S was here, I don't. I mean, we do have first pick, so right. So you're you know, that's, what I, that's what I assumed. I assumed there'd be no nominations for for you. What about uh, Tomati and Andy? Do you, do you guys have nominations? Potentially for the tenth. Um, no, no nominations for me. But uh, a bit of a confession. Um, I've only just in the last couple of weeks realised that we had twelve picks, and oh, not you, ten. So, so you're <laughs> I planned for ten, <laughs> and so um, you know, how it, I've it's made me um, think again a lot harder about. Okay, so I need a, a few more picks to to finish this off. So um, yeah, more of a confession. Anything else? But um, no, no nominations from me. And no nominations from Team Israelite because we're playing it close to the chest for the next three oh, rounds. Wow, this is, you see, this is a welcome change before. It, it was, was hey. eager, eager to give nominations, eager to block other people from. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, like this, we're gonna have, not going to have a lot of talk about the 10th round if there's not going to be a lot of nominations. What, what would you guys like to see then if we're going to talk? I know there was some discussion in the Discord about, uh, about Green Lanterns and the lack of Green Lanterns. I'm shocked. I am I shocked. Shocked. I too am shocked at the lack of Green Lanterns. Yeah. I, I mean, has, has, have any of the, I mean, this is probably a question for the captains. Um, has anybody not thought of, of drafting? Uh, Green Lantern, because I, I personally know I have. I've I've thought of of drafting one. Um, I haven't, of course. So um, have the others thought about selecting, or is it just an oversight? Uh, I have. I in the very first round, I was talking with Michael um, about. Uh, I mean, I adore the Green Lantern mythos. So Martin and I may have to go head to head <laughs> and get in a cat fight about which Green Lanterns we're we're going to pick. Yeah, because I feel that coming. I feel that yeah. coming somehow. Yeah. Do you guys feel it? What, Do you guys feel it? What makes that shuffling? I mean, you know, that one of the things that I had thought about earlier is that given that there are, you know, a, a diverse slate of Green Lanterns, you know, mm -hmm. people tend to uh, have their favorites. And I think having their favorite yeah. means that people get to be a little closer to the vest about um, waiting in terms of uh, drafting their favorites. And now we are, here we are in the 10th. But all it takes is one team to draft a Green Lantern that maybe another team didn't see coming to set off a domino effect of people feeling like they need, everybody needs a lantern of their own. So that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping for a run on Green Lanterns um, and, you know, at least three lanterns drafted in this round would be amazing. I want to see, I want to um, see a Russian Jewish communist Kilowog. <laughs> I didn't see that coming at all. Not me neither. <laughs> <laughs> well, because remember that Kilowog comes from a planet that is very that has basically an almost communist framework for how they for how they structure society. Um, they don't have Western style capitalism that we're used to. So, uh, just a thought, just a thought, putting it out there. That's all. That's all. all. Right. It's, it's not official. Just uh, mm -hmm. throwing throwing us off the scent. I got it. <laughs> but, uh, in earlier rounds I, I did consider selecting a green lantern and i was i was gonna, actually going to fan cast uh taika waititi as as one of them oh, <laughs> as as a nod as a nod to the the awful um film that he was actually in he was in green lantern oh he was he was yeah. yes <laughs> opposite ryan, ryan reynolds as his friend oh okay yes. I, I didn't but remember. no more so because it'd be awesome to could you imagine some of the quirk and imagination of of Taika creating yes. co constructs. I need it in my eyes and in my veins <laughs> that right be, now. That would be crazy. You're doing this. <laughs> we shall see. We shall see. The Jewish delegation now demands it. A formal, a formal request. Well, you guys could select them too, you know. So, oh, that's is, right. That's right. He's Jewish, an he is, Jew. He is Jewish, Jewish as well. There you go. Well, and, and just on that, actually, there's, I mean, when I was thinking through, like, like uh, a lot of the characters and, you know, fan casting and stuff, there are a lot of, there are a lot of uh, mixed Jewish um, actors and actresses out there too, right? Oh, wow. yeah, we're everywhere. We are everywhere. Great selections for fan casting. We, we had to, we have to change our names because mm. white supremacy in the United States and, and actually all over the world is unforgiving. 
Um, so, you know, there we are everywhere. <laughs> True. Well, other than Green Lanterns, what else would you like to see in a 10th round? Where mm. are the spies? Where are the people yeah. that know espionage and, and tech? I mean, I selected Angela Spica, the engineer, because she has really incredible relationship with tech, obviously, and she knows how to pilot the carrier. Um, so I'm wondering, but every team needs a spy. Where, where is the spy? Where are the spies? I mean, yet again, they're under the radar. They're so under the radar. <laughs> Um, I was I, I was actually you know in in general um, I'm, I always say that every round is a great time to get more female representation um, so hopefully we can get a round that where there are a lot of uh, female characters drafted. Um, if, if I'd love to see some non-binary characters as well, but we need more women. Come yeah. on, guys! You're sitting yeah. on so many awesome women. You guys are such fools <laughs> but that's okay. it, it works it works to my advantage and kia's advantage and tomati has been the best about this tomati has been five absolute of my mind so far yes yes <laughs> yes yeah. and i and i, I would I, expect I, no less no less i'm trying well, tomati someone who's been, maori tomati's been uh, alternating essentially right yeah i mean apart from the last uh, the the last pick um that was my back-to-back -back, uh female pick okay yeah um but also i mean with the selection of and sorry for this uh martin but um of america chavez as well having her as <laughs> as as sexually fluid as well mm -hmm. you know um so i mean i made the conscious choice to have have a character like like america um, mm -hmm. um because of who is who is pan yeah right america much yeah Oh, I thought America yeah. was just gay. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I think you're right. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I, she is, she is depicted as, as gay, but I mean, I kind of left, left a bit of f flexibility in there as well, mm -hmm. as far as her character is concerned. So, um, yeah, I was, uh, I have been having a look over everyone else's selections and seeing if there was anyone, any other characters that were either gay and or, or by what or whatever um so but i haven't seen to my knowledge i haven't seen too many others so we really do need queer representation i mean Real. uh you know what's his name has uh harley's out there harley harley's been picked uh right. he's been picked um uh, valkyrie remember valkyrie yes there yes. you go yep there you go so so you know there's representation there yep i've got two of them two of those picks yeah that's right does that tie into um, Maori oh. concepts of, of uh, gender and different types of conceptions of sexuality and the whole framework and matrix for, for gender identity? And, and like, I want to know more about that. Yeah, I mean, just, just quickly, I mean, it's one of the, I mean, it does, I mean, there's people talking about it every day, uh, but within, our, within Maori culture, um, we don't have separate words for he, she or they mm -hmm. it's one word and so there's the, the fluidity in, in the language um, to be able to identify someone as he she or they it's one word rather than breaking it all up and making those <gasps> ultimate distinctions so it's fluid that way um sexuality as well i mean and and i guess definitely pre-colonial times um, right uh, sexuality was was a fluid concept um, and it's only because of the, of course, the influx of colonization, Christianity, that has uh, made it as, as it is today. So we're, I mean, so as a culture, we, we too are relearning and unpacking a lot of that stuff. Um, so, yeah, so I tried to reflect that in, in the characters that, that we've selected. And it's not just the Māori thing. This is uh, pretty, it's a, a common cultural um, thread, definitely pre-colonial uh, for other Polynesian um, cultures as well. So, yeah. I believe so, yeah, for so all indigenous, it seems like all. Oh, I can't speak on others, but <clears throat> one thing that I definitely, um, um, two things actually. So the first thing is that you know let's not forget uh, Billy Kaplan was also drafted um, as far as mm -hmm. uh, queer representation, um, yes. but and but uh, the other thing that I had 
I guess I'd been meaning to mention, um, you know, in one of the earlier rounds, uh, I, I know I talked about it when we were first conceptualizing the draft, that every, that you, um, even though it's a racial draft, that, you know, you do have a certain degree of uh, flexibility when it comes to um, things like uh, uh, non-binary gender and um, if you if you want in the in the in the creation of the backstory to do um, to do that um, in terms of uh, when you recontextualize the character you you do have that flexibility as within your drafting power so I mean I don't know if that means that there are some characters that you might have been willing to uh, further bend so to speak um, but you know let me know or you could say it yeah. on the right now um, and th- we could you know take take note of that I think um, I, I mentioned it in earlier in earlier um, podcasts as well one of the uh, more interesting things for me was is to uh, I guess nationality bend as well seeing as most of the characters uh, depicted in, in well, I know Marvel Comics better, but in Marvel Comics have a, quite a, a, an American-centric um, spin to them. And so in, so in, in selecting characters, it's, it's one thing to race bend them, but also kind of almost nationality bend them as well mm-hmm. uh, to make them fit the, the narrative and the, and, the, and the stories that I'm, I'm trying to do. So um, it's something I never considered uh, prior to the draft, but it's something I had to, had to think really hard about. And I'm not too sure if others have kind of felt that way too. Me too. I've definitely felt that way. Definitely felt that way. And just to touch on what something what that Tomati said earlier, I'm all for characters being drafted where characters have been decolonized and new frameworks of sexuality and gender are being expressed in a whole different non-Western way. But um, yes, Tomati, I feel the same as you. Um, I would actually, I actually think that DC Comics is more American centric in a lot of ways, and very mm-hmm. uh, Christian centric, yeah. more, much more so than Marvel. But that's another discussion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think part, I think part of what what's what's at work with DC Comics is because because they don't have that whole world outside your window aspect that Marvel has. These their fictional cities are meant to be kind of while evocative of real places, not um, not bound by by the reality of those places, so they stick to these traditional archetypes, and these are very long term traditional, um, old school traditional, and, and so I I can't think of very many um, cities that that exist outside of the U.S. in the DC universe. You know that mm. like at the same level of like a metropolis or a Gotham or a um, you know central coast city, what have you. And I think you know one of the things. Genosha. That, no, no, in, in DC. Uh, it's not DC, yeah. DC. Yeah, um, I, I would just like to quickly interject that DC has always been viewed, I think, at least in my framework and my history of comics with comics, it's the slightly more white bread, mm-hmm. optimistic version. Of, super, of a superhero universe, where, as Michael said, yeah. we all know Marvel is much more open your window and see what's going on in the local neighborhood and dealing with social issues. And, you know, then, of course, we have the unfortunate foray into grim, dark comics. Right. So we won't talk about that, but do go mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Well, one of, so one of the ideas that I had is that, I mean, I, I assume we've all seen the Wonder Woman movie. Um, yep. you know, so we've all seen what? The Wonder Woman movie? Yes. So yes. as I remember it, she's based out of France in the beginning of the movie when she's, when she's in the museum. Is that? I, I, yes, she's, she is. She's in Paris restoring statues, Greek right. statues. She's in the Louvre. Yeah. Yeah. In the, yeah, the Louvre. Yeah. I, I, I thought it was the Louvre. And I was thinking that there's no reason that the Wonder Woman has to be based in the U.S. Um, you know, she particularly seems like a citizen of the world and could be the kind of person whose sort of sort of home home base is in Europe, but does a lot of business in the U.S. Whether as a diplomat or as a you know just sort of roving superhero, to the extent that that many I think you know she could benefit a lot from having 
a home base, a city of her own to protect the way uh, Batman has Gotham and Superman has Metropolis to give her kind of a European, you know, DCized, um, you know, fake city to, to put under her protection, you know, maybe somewhere in Greece um, or, you know, Greek or Rome or, you know, whatever an analog for, <laughs> for, for, you know. Well, she has, she has Themyscira. True, but that's yeah, like set off from, you know, it's 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 its own thing set off from 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 uh, citizens from uh, civilians, so to speak. You know, do you I, guys re- do you guys do you- remember when Gail Simone was briefly on the Wonder Woman title? I want to say like two thousand six, two thousand and seven ish, and she had Wonder Woman being defended by Kate Spencer, Manhunter coming to Los Angeles and temporarily relocating to Los Angeles and driving a hum V. So just, it, was, it was the cognitive dissonance. And she acknowledged that in the issue, like Diana was very conflicted, but I agree. I think Diana needs to be based elsewhere. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I think, Agreed. I think she's one of the major characters that could actually put a non-American DC city on the map. And, Partic- and particularly make- a multiracial Diana. Yeah. Well, why why is she tied to Europe? Why can't it be South America or uh, somewhere on the continent or South Asia or somewhere like that? That's true. You're right. The multiracial Diana definitely has the the advantage of being being based anywhere. And, and I, I'd still I still would prefer her in the Eastern Hemisphere, um, just because there's so little representation out there. Um, uh-huh. But but I agree. It could be. There are a number of multi, um, multi-ethnic multi cities that she could represent. It reminds me of, it, it just suddenly random observation, it reminds me that Hawkman under Jeff Johns when he was trying to fix Hawkman continuity, just Hawk continuity in general, had Carter and Kendra relocate to St. Roche precisely because it was such a diverse city. Okay. which I thought was a really nice acknowledgement to Carter's background, but you all know, you guys all know that I love the Hawks like crazy. So just wanted to say that. I. You should select them, Annie. Mm-hmm. I can't really what? select the Hawks because they're so tied to pantheism. Pantheism, they're so tied uh, to right. the Egyptian pantheon and I can't really do that. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Yeah. Probably. So, uh, I guess I mean I guess it's time for final thoughts. Uh, unless you guys have any other things that you'd like to see in the tenth round. More villains. I want more villains. Yeah, there's been a f- yeah. there've been a fair amount of villains, but you know, yeah, last couple rounds. More. There's so many heroes out there, though, guys. Yeah, and where are the anti-heroes? Where are the anti-heroes? I mean, you know, I think Joaquin's filling out the anti-hero. Right <laughs> yeah, <now. laughs> well, they're true. over Joaquin's team. <laughs> um, well, Joaquin uh, has just gone straight up villainy at this point. <laughs> Go on. I, I love it. I love it. Um, I'm gonna. I've got someone in mind to select. I mean, who is who? I'm still surprised is on the board. Oh, okay. that's a team. Uh, yeah, it's, I mean, I've, I thought they would have gone earlier. Um, and I think perhaps mainly because they're one of, not one of the most um, hyper-powered of, of characters, but um, their, their backstory and their, um, uh, their abilities, again, made me Tell us more. I'm not going to tell, tell too much more. more. Tell us, tell us, give, give us more. Just, Stop teasing. I'm just going to say. More <laughs> um, tell us more um, so that, we can hear, hero block you. They're, hero block me, eh? Um, how about this? They they aren't affiliated to a team, so they're definitely um, more of a solo act. Um, but again, uh, considering that this character has had uh, more and more uh, exposure and a whole lot of different mediums over the last couple of years, I would have thought they might have got may have got selected and that's all i'm gonna say okay yeah okay but, um, okay but, yeah all right but uh so yeah bianca del rio eye roll 
<laughs> I'm teasing. I'm teasing. Interesting. All right. Well, I have some. I have some thoughts, but I'm not going to uh, put it out there to potentially sway people. Um, but yeah. So, so final thoughts, guys. Just is your chance to 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 bring it on home. We unfortunately, Marquis not here to 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 tie a bow on everything. So you guys each get a chance to do it. Uh, Annie, start. Let's start with you. Really good round. Everybody seemed to have brought their A game. Um, I still want to know the backstory for the one above all, but it seems like people are really leveling up in terms of just pacing and tactical decisions. That's all I'll say. Great round. Really good round. Uh, Tomati? Um, similar to Annie, um, fantastic round. And it's been pretty amazing to see the, the evolution of this whole, the whole draft process, really. I'm um, thinking back to our very first, uh, very first round to now, it's uh, just the, the growth, I think. The growth across all the teams as to um, who and why they're selecting uh, characters. So, yeah, long may it continue. Um, yeah, effectively three more rounds to go, yeah. 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 Um, Martin? Once again, it's just, you know, great round. This was a really great round. Great picks. You know, there's some that definitely probably should have gone earlier. Uh, like, uh, and there's I'm no doubt in my mind that in the next three rounds, there's going to be some picks that are going to be like, oh, they should have been picked earlier too. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, like, I this is the first time I've been on here. I apologize if I was, like, maybe a bit nervous. And, uh, I mean, one of the first things that happened when I came on was – someone just trying to make me bless the entire time <laughs> <laughs> but, you know I, i'm okay i'm okay with that uh yeah um then would maybe... that person have been kia i yes. neither <laughs> confirm nor deny <laughs> okay discretion <laughs> discretion <laughs> uh but yeah and then and maybe maybe i can try and be on here a little later and uh maybe next week when i turn because after this thursday i'm 25 years old yay oh, congrats, congrats. oh you got an upcoming birthday we're gonna make your life a living hell of celebration oh my god you shouldn't have told us that good to know no it's fine i am a slightly open book more or less <laughs> except when it comes to you know things that matter like my picks <laughs> i like your picks I, I love it and i'm i am really impressed um at the, the creativity of everyone. Um, there are so many players, uh, so much talent still out there. And I'm, you know, I'm really glad that we didn't do a short draft because there's just so much room for the, you know, the race bending and the reimagining, yeah. thinking about, you know, how these characters um, are going to interact. I had so much, you know, in these discussions that we've had in the Discord, I had so many ideas for future episodes even after the teams are, sh are chosen and when we're waiting for the you know the scoring and, and the books to play out you know we're going to have some some good things in mind even though they're not going to be structured around uh the draft the, the making the picks, like discussions about these picks you know hopefully i'm going to get in touch with with um eli about getting some of these commissions in so that we can see how how these uh characters might potentially interact in yes. Various forms. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, definitely. I've got some ideas about, um, and I guess I, I, a, good, a, a good time to talk about it here with you guys present is um, reimagining some of the major comics events, but with the characters in there, you know, these sort of the iconic covers, but with these characters in their race bent forms. I was just going to say it would be awesome mm. to discuss current storylines. And but then talk about how our race bending and recontextualizations would affect what's happening. So I was literally just going to suggest that. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking of yeah, thinking of that, but I was also thinking about it in terms of sort of like the big time major storylines that you know that of, of historically, the, right? Exactly. Um, with, with and with those those characters being uh, being being bent. You know, so I've got some. And the implications, the implications historically. Oh, that's going to be some great discussions. Yeah. I'm really looking mm -hmm. forward to that. 
Uh, we're gonna, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to kick around, you know, we'll kick around in the discord when we get closer to the end of the draft about which events you guys would like to kind of do deep dives on. And um, yeah, I mean, stay tuned guys, listeners, um, you know, stay, stay immersed, uh, try to join us in our discord community. Uh, hit me up my MTF uh, III on Twitter or racial draft pod, uh, the official uh, Twitter account or on uh, Facebook at racial draft um, or on Twitter. I mean, not Twitter, sorry, on uh, Instagram at racial dot draft. And um, yeah, we're, we're always looking to talk. We're always looking to expand listenership and expand the fan base. You know, um, Martin can tell you firsthand, he started out as a listener and now he's guesting on the show. So really is that, Oh wow. That's awesome. I didn't know that. How yes. did I not know that? Yes. It's amazing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so there you go. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's there. I really want this, this thing to grow. And, you know, I'm, I, I, can, I can only do but so much on my own. This thing wouldn't be what it is without all the great people in the community, without these amazing captains, with all this creativity. So, you know, I, I, I would like to extend my thanks to the, to, the, to the folks that are here as guests on the show for everything that you've done so far. And I want to extend, you know, my extended thanks to the other captains that are maybe listening. And hopefully we'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger bolder and bolder and um until next time until next time until next time all right until next time all things stay safe fun. everyone <laughs> yeah.